Well, hello, church. God bless you. Today we're in chapter 17. Uh, it's entitled, The Kingdom's Fall. But I want to add to that title, How Dead Ends Can Lead to New Beginnings. And we talked last week about Hezekiah. And unfortunately, Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, completely took the kingdom in an opposite direction to a point that was unrecoverable, kind of like they got too close to the waterfall. There was no turning back. And after a series of a few more kings, with one notable exception being Josiah, who was a king after God's heart, all of the other kings took them further, further down the road to destruction until finally Jerusalem and Judah was conquered, just as the north had been conquered. The Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar come in and utterly destroy Jerusalem and take the people, thousands of them, into captivity into Babylon. And it's kind of interesting. We know that the reason that that they turned away from God was because of idols. And so Babylon is going to is kind of the idol capital of the world. And it's almost God saying, okay, you want idols? I'm going to give you idols, kind of like the man in the Old Testament, till they come out your nostrils. And interesting, idolatry is broken over the people of Israel later because of that whole experience. But throughout that whole time, the prophets continue to plead on God's behalf. Turn back, Israel, Judah, turn back. Can you imagine 344 years take place of prophets begging the people to turn back to God, and yet they refuse? During this period that we're studying, there are two very important prophets that are mentioned. One is Ezekiel. And the other is Jeremiah. And let me just mention Jeremiah, especially in chapter 1, verse 5, because he's such a great uh, testimony for all of us. Uh, He was called as a very young man, probably a teenager. And this this famous word, I love Jeremiah 1, 5, where God comes to him and says, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, and I appointed you to be a prophet. And of course, like we've seen before, Jeremiah gives every excuse in the book. I'm too young. (laughs) I can't speak. And God just keeps coming back and back, but I'm going to be with you. And especially comes this word, I will put my very words in your mouth. And I just want to note this again in the big story, how important this storyline is. In the New Testament, we find out clearly, Ephesians 2.10, that each one of us is God's masterpiece, called for good works. You don't just have a job. You're not just a mom or dad. You are an appointed, called person who is anointed for works that God had for you to do before you were ever born. And there's no reason to have an excuse. Why? Because God himself will put the words in your mouth. God himself will fight for you. It's not about you. It's about what God will do through you. And what an important word that is. Now, what's very interesting with Jeremiah is that he had a really tough calling. God tells him, you're going to prophesy to these people. They're never going to listen to you. And at the end of the day, they're all going into captivity. How many of you would like a job description that says you're going to pour your heart out, you're going to be persecuted, and nobody is ever going to listen to you? (laughs) And in the eyes of the world, you're going to be one big failure. Now, we know in the long run, the opposite was true. We have Jeremiah's book today, and millions of lives have been changed because of Jeremiah. But he didn't see that success. And what I want to make the point, because I think it's a very important point, When you do hear God's call and you take God's appointment, the key is that God wants you to do it out of faithfulness, not to be successful. If you try to fulfill your calling and if you have to look at it as how can I be successful, you're going to give up. But Jeremiah said, no, this is not about how people respond. This is about being faithful to God, getting up every day, doing what God tells me to do and letting that be my reward. And that's the key 
to be fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Now, one of the main points that I want to highlight today is how interesting it is that that though Judah is taken captive, just like the northern tribes, Israel, there's a different outcome. We know with the northern tribes, they were destroyed. But with the southern tribes, they go into captivity, but they're restored. They, they actually will come back to the land, and the rest of our story in the Old Testament will be talking about this remnant that actually eventually comes back, and from this remnant, Jesus Christ, Mary, actually is born. And, and the key is this that I want to point out today. The key is that the southern tribe had a different response. That whereas the northern tribe, both of them experienced consequences, the northern tribe hardened their heart, whereas Judah, many of them, humbled their heart. They both had consequences for their sin. But one saw it as punishment and God's not fair, and the other saw it as God's discipline, his correction, and chose to embrace it and learn from it. And this is such a great lesson because the result was they were restored. Uh, they didn't become destroyed, that they became rebirthed, and, and they, they, there wasn't a dead end. They still saw God recover and restore their purpose. And so this is a very important subject for us. The Bible has a lot to speak to us about God's discipline. Have you ever been disciplined by God? Well, I sure have. And, and I want to just read, because this is sort of one of the most famous verses, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 5, where it talks about God disciplining his children. He says, Have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that a father addresses like to a son? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more shall we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms, weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather you might be healed. Now, what I want to say so clearly is that God wants to discipline, and his first plan for disciplining us is his word. <laughs> and Jesus said in John 15, 3, you're cleansed by my word. In other words, God's first plan is to just speak his word to you and you listen. That's, that's called discipleship. But sometimes we don't listen. And in fact, Psalm 32, 9 says, don't be like a mule who has to have a bit and a bridle. I mean, why won't you just let God lead you? Why do you have to have God, you know, because you're so stubborn? But the truth is we all are stubborn sometimes. So the second level of discipline is consequences. Now, when we talk about God's discipline, please don't think of God giving someone cancer or putting you in a car accident. That's something completely different. That happens because of a fallen world. What we're talking about is God allowing us the consequences of our failure to obey him or listen to him or do what he wants us to do. And, and there's some things here that we just read that God says about discipline. Number one is that it flows from God's love. The one who God loves, he disciplines. He's not trying to punish us. And this is a very important thing to learn. God addresses issues in our life to restore us, to heal us, to redeem us, uh, not to condemn us. And why I, why I say that so much is because some people mistake the voice of Satan for the voice of God. Satan comes to condemn us when we have failed. 
but God comes to correct and redeem us. And any of you who've ever blown it, you failed, and you hear the voice, as it were, something rubbing your face in it, you, you know, your voice that says, I'm so ashamed of you, you're so unworthy, that is not God. That is Satan. God doesn't even deal with the past. God is speaking of your future. I, I tell people in divorce recovery, God isn't trying to unscramble the egg. He's trying to make an omelet. He's not trying to pull up and say what happened and make you feel like us. He's saying, let's go forward. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, we quote here all the time. That's to people who were in captivity, who blew it. And God says, I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. When God disciplines us, it's to restore and give us healing and hope for the future. Now, the key, though, is how we respond. How we respond to, to God's correction, to consequences that come into our life, is determines whether we will become hardened or we will become humbled, determines whether we will uh, be destroyed or we will be restored. It can go either way. I say it this way, for, for the one who hardens his heart, they become like a rock that has to be shattered, but, but the one who humbles their heart becomes like clay that God reshapes and remakes after his own image and his own will. And this is why this is told to us over and over. Don't despise the discipline of the Lord. Don't get stubborn and, you know, don't get, get a victim mindset. God's allowing these things to happen to you, not to harm you, but to redirect you, to heal you, and to ultimately restore you. And the issue is how will you respond? Uh, I, I use the illustration sometimes. Sometimes God offends the mind to expose the heart. God allows things that are happening in our life, our failures, uh, hardships that come because we didn't make good decisions, um, things that happen to us because we're neglectful of the disciplines that he wants us to follow. And we may hear a voice that's saying, you stupid, you stupid. That's not his voice. His voice is, look, listen, hello. It's time to change. I can heal this. I can restore you. I can put you back on track. I think all of you might relate to this. I remember my dad, you know, those famous words, Dale, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. Well, I didn't believe it at first, but later I saw it. And I have to admit, sometimes when I was corrected, I hardened my heart. And it just drove me away from my dad and got me into more trouble. But I also know there was a time when I was corrected by him and it broke me and it led me to Christ. Don't harden your heart is what, what the Hebrews writer says. Don't get an attitude of resistance. Don't be stubborn. But what? Humble yourself. And if you humble yourself, God will take that pain and he'll restore you to you the years the locusts have eaten. Uh, you know, I like what it says in Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your law. We, we see every successful person, victorious Christian, at the root of their journey was, they blew it, but they had what we called last week, a successful failure. <laughs> they said, I gotta change, I gotta hear God. I've got to look inside and see what God wants to deal with in this situation. And so how do you do that? You humble yourself. And that's what we're going to see over these next weeks. You, you're, how do you do that? You're totally honest before God. You say, God, I, I'm feeling this pain, and I know that there's something in me. Search my heart, God. You know, don't just live in denial. Don't do what we do so often. We numb the pain. We live in denial. We make excuses. We rationalize. Well, it's someone else's fault. If they hadn't done this, I wouldn't be in this mess. And all we do is sentence ourselves to a wilderness. Don't cover up the pain. You know, some people begin to go through a pain of loneliness. 
And instead of saying, God, show me what that loneliness is. Maybe I'm being selfish and I'm thinking about it. They just drown themselves in TV or something. But every time there is a, there's a pain, I love what C.S. Lewis said. He says, God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. He's saying, no, look, I'm trying to correct something that will restore your life. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Boy, 5, 6 says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll say, I need you, God, if you'll choose to learn from, from your mistake, God will make you great. I just heard a story of my friend Mike McGregor, and he, when he came back to God, he was a thief, and he had worked for like FedEx, and he had stolen some over $60,000. And, and after he came to the Lord, he could have just moved on, but he says, no, I'm going to have to humble myself. And he, he confessed it. He was ready to go to jail. And, and he just all of a sudden, though, he had the chance to work it off and pay off his debt. But his humility so endeared him to people who knew him that many people came to the Lord. And because of his honesty, he started a business after that that became very successful. That's the story over and over. People who humble themselves, who say, wow, I've made mistakes. God, I'm going to learn everything I can from this. God, change me. God, let me see what I've done in my marriage that's selfish. God, restore me. Those people then hear God's promise, and all through these prophets will hear these promises, that if you'll turn to me, like one author said, that God never, stand, his, his standards never change, but neither does his compassion. So Jeremiah will say in Lamentations 3.23, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. His compassions, they never fail. If you'll just turn back, Israel, if you'll learn your lessons, God will restore you, Joel 2.25. He'll restore the years of the locusts of Eden. He'll bring you back to your land and your inheritance. He'll raise you up again. The question is, how humble are you willing to be? How honest are you willing to be? How broken are you willing to be before God so he can restore you? The last point I want to make is, is this whole Old Testament, kind of very sober, sobering, I would guess we would all agree, there is so much judgment and so much failure. And you know, if you just read it like some people read it, and you say, well, the, the point of the story is we've got to try harder than those people did, it could be very discouraging. We can read as we have, and we can say, wow, Moses, Moses, he didn't even get to enter in the land because of anger. And David, wow, he's the man after God's own heart, and he totally blew it with Bathsheba. And the prophets and all those people, and they still went after idols. Do you think I'm going to be better than that? You see, if that's the way you read it, it's going to give you despairing and discouragement. But in Jeremiah 31, 31, Jeremiah gives you a whole different way of looking at it. He says the point of the story is that that was an old covenant. That was people trying to serve God by their efforts. And that covenant failed. It could not save people. It could not change people. It could not heal people. It is a covenant that says, if it's going to be, it's up to you. You've got to do it by your works. And so listen to the point, Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest to the least. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. All the old covenant points to Jesus. And it says, it is never going to be if it's up to us, but there is coming someone who is going to make a new covenant. And it, 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 we're going to be saved not because we're good enough for God, but because he comes and replaces the failure of man's righteousness with his own righteousness. He dies for us. And then he promises to give us the Holy Spirit. 
And that Holy Spirit, if we will be filled, will change us from the inside, will give us this overwhelming, displacing urge of love, to love God that will cause us to change and live after a new nature, not by our might, not by our power, but by his Holy Spirit. That's the hope in Jesus. Well, God bless you as you look into this some more. May you be changed and filled today. Amen.